When Sachiko Kiyomi was getting her first dose of the vaccine, New York City was approaching the peak of its second wave, with more new cases each day than ever before. Still, the availability of vaccines offered a beacon of hope to healthcare workers in and out of the city. A Kiyomi story begins before there was light at the end of the tunnel, in complete darkness, in fact. On a rainy April 2020 evening, Kiyomi and two nursing assistants were at the back of a dark trailer truck that was being used to collect the bodies of the deceased after the morgue had reached capacity. They were looking for a spot in the crowded trailer to lay down the body of a resident in their nursing home when their flashlight suddenly went out. So it was so full, we had to go all the way inside of the trailer truck. All around her were body bags labeled with the names of those she had previously cared for. Down the middle, space had been carved out for a stretcher. They pushed the stretcher further and further in until the cord powering their light was stretched taut and popped out of the outlet. In total darkness, they started to panic and suited up in layers of PPE, their phones were also out of reach. I'm like, oh my God, we are crying. And one person was able to get the phone. I was like, let's just do this, let's just do this. And it will put the body down. My name is Julia Ingram. And for my Honors in the Arts project, I wrote three narrative nonfiction stories, each centered on a different healthcare worker in New York City, where I'm from. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, healthcare workers have been championed as heroes but their distinct experiences get swallowed by global chaos, blending in with each other as so much of the world copes with iterations of the same crisis. My project aims to preserve some of these stories, highlighting the individual while making sense of the collective experience. Each one centers on one person's experience of the onset of the pandemic through at least summer 2020. These stories explore moments of confronting the unknown, making life or death decisions in the face of limited time and resources, and the psychological toll of fighting a tidal wave of tragedy. Along with Sachiko Kiyomi, I also spoke with Ravi Katari, a young emergency room doctor who becomes disillusioned in the wake of the pandemic's first wave, and Alex Byropoulos, a veteran clinical researcher racing the clock to find a treatment for COVID-induced blood clots. I've spent my time at Stanford studying English literature and practicing journalism. So for my honors capstone, I wanted to combine these two interests, and I wrote my stories in the style of narrative journalism. Narrative journalism uses literary techniques to cover a true, and in this case, current story. It's well explained by Jock Hart, journalist and author of the narrative nonfiction guide, Storycraft. He writes, the version of the story we'd publish would have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Strong internal structure would regulate pace and create dramatic tension. Instead of sources, it would have characters. Instead of topics, it would have scenes. It would be scrupulously accurate but it would reveal truths beyond the reach of an ordinary news report. I break this description down into two major components, which fall in line with the two mediums being combined here. First, the narrative techniques, structure, pace, character, and scenes. The most straightforward journalism follows an inverted pyramid structure with the most important information at the top. It's designed so that if the reader doesn't finish the article, they still walk away with the key details. But narratives build suspense and play with chronology. They don't tell the reader everything in the first paragraph. My project particularly focuses on the distinction Hart draws between sources and characters. I'm trying to bring each of the people that I write about to life on the page and structure each narrative around their individual experience. In these stories, an individual has resonance not only for the information value they provide, but for the person they represent. I interviewed several healthcare workers on Zoom before settling on three to stress center my stories on. My challenge was then to translate a real person into a character like you read in a book, with a legible personality, desires, and conflicts. John Franklin, a writer who won the first ever Pulitzer Prize for feature writing, posed a different way of thinking about it. He wrote that a narrative writer's challenge is to show how someone's inner world stacks up against the outside reality they face. So narrative journalism focuses on the interiority of a person as well as the particular moment they're living in. Most of journalism focuses on the latter, with the people involved being sources of information from which to build a picture of the outside reality. The second part of Jack Hart's explanation of narrative journalism is truthfulness. He wrote of scrupulous accuracy. There's no room for invention in journalism. Everything in my project is attributable either to my interviews, an outside source, or my own observation. But Hart also claimed that his story would bring about truths that an ordinary report couldn't. 
These are emotional truths, things we can't render simply by stating them, or in classic creative writing terms, showing, not telling. Well, Charlene, we've heard for weeks now from paramedics that they were pronouncing hundreds of people dead at home on a daily basis, and those people uh, might not have been counted, suggesting that the actual death toll was much higher than what we originally knew. Thus far, medical attention is focused on damage to the lungs, but now there's an early study out of Mount Sinai that suggests the disease is actually disrupting the way our blood flowed. Demand for COVID tests is rising ahead of the holidays, even though the CDC warned everyone to just stay put. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo's administration is under federal scrutiny for its handling of COVID-related fatality data at nursing homes. When I flew back home from Stanford in March 2020, I became one of many who witnessed the pandemic through a barrage of headlines. Every night during the first few months of lockdown at 7 p.m., New Yorkers would lean out of their windows to cheer in gratitude for healthcare workers. I would join them, but I still couldn't shake the feeling that I didn't have a grasp on what was going on outside of my own four walls. There was just too much to keep up with, and I felt too disconnected. As a journalist, I felt a responsibility to contribute to documenting the crisis, but I didn't want to simply add to the influx of news stories that was overwhelming my social media feed. Australian journalist Megan Lane Monsieur, who writes about the concept of slow journalism, wrote over a year before the pandemic, that fast news, ironically, becomes a device to aid our forgetting. So I asked myself, how could I write without accelerating desensitization? I concluded that narratives are the best way to truly comprehend what has happened over the past year. It's been well established that stories are crucial for learning and memory, and in a time of information overload, they're more essential than ever. Constructing that scrupulously accurate and emotionally moving narrative that Hart describes typically requires immersion. That's why sometimes narrative journalism is called immersion journalism. But of course, that wasn't possible. I never met any of the people I interviewed, visited their homes, or saw their places of work. But even if I had been able to navigate their worlds in person, my reconstruction would still be limited by flaws in memory and an inevitable layer of narrative distance that occurs when writing nonfiction. So I wanted to put my process on display. With first-person narration, I signal to the reader when I'm filling in gaps as the storyteller and I also simulate the process of trying to understand someone without having ever met them. In some ways, these stories demonstrate how physical separation and digital connection influence the way people understood each other during the pandemic, because that is part of the story. This trial was simply testing different doses of a very well-known drug. Bridging this gap was especially challenging for Dr. Alex Byropoulos, the clinical researcher. With scientific news, the person behind the headline is even more invisible. Particularly with vaccines, everyone is eager to hear of the clinical breakthroughs that can beat the virus. The process isn't as important. But what was it like for the researcher actually reaching these groundbreaking conclusions? Here's an excerpt from the piece. Spiropolis was making every effort to provide more evidence-based treatment methods as fast as possible. He's a methodical man, so busy that I was surprised he was able to make time to speak with me on multiple occasions. His rectangular, frameless glasses betrayed the many moving parts on his laptop screen during our Zoom interview. He's working through hospital site coordinators and overwhelmed nurses with the goal of minimizing protocol violations. The goal is to ensure that coordinators and nurses are administering the study drug, reporting laboratory assessments as per the protocol, getting testing requirements as per the protocol. The phrase rang through the interview, rigidity was the foundation for any sound medical decision in his eyes. Violations jeopardize the reliability of their conclusions and could even endanger the patient. This is an example of my own observation and synthesis entering the foreground. But if I have to make these narrative leaps anyway, why not just write fiction? Well, if I fictionalized a healthcare worker's experience based on research, it might be compelling, but it loses some of its weight in the fact that it's not based on a real person's real life. On the other hand, if I generalize the experiences that help of healthcare workers based on my interviews, as so much media has understandably done in the rush to keep up with the news cycle, it wouldn't generate the same emotional response in readers. Instead, I wanted readers to form a connection with the people that I'm writing about. I wanted to show them the emotions and experiences that these people had and not just by stating them. Our plan is to fully reopen New York City on July 1st. We are mm. ready. This is gonna be the summer of New York City. In the United States, the pandemic is slowly entering the rearview. Mask mandates are being lifted, and vaccines are becoming more widespread. The influx of news that motivated this project is no longer a daily occurrence. Still, I hope that with these stories, 
I can enter the experiences of the people that I wrote about into our collective memory of this historical moment. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoy my project.